All right, and we're back already for our next panel, which is going to be on publishing 2020, influencing the live performance publishing space. And I'm going to give it up right away for all of our panelists. Enjoy. Nice to see you all here. Are you having a good time at Most Wanted? It's already uh, not long left, so we have to make the most of the last few hours. Um, thank you so much for coming. My name's Mandy Aubrey. I'm Director of Global Business Development and Client Relations at Song Trust, a global publishing administration company. Um, I think it's great to first, uh, there are two things, we just want to work out who's in the audience um, so we can see who, you know, what things are just going to be too much <laughs> for you. So who is um, an artist, uh, songwriter with uh, very little uh, understanding of publishing? And don't be shy. Great. Now there's one person here who I think was at my publishing workshop yesterday and he says that he still has very little understanding about uh, publishing. So that's a really good um, gauge of how this topic can be quite alienating. So come back and always try to learn more. Um, anyone really quite confident? Um, I see we have someone from BIM Berlin, so she's a specialist in publishing, I think. So is there anyone else who feels very comfortable with publishing? Some of you, okay. Good. Well, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to the panelists today. Um, James, do you want to start with a little introduction about who you are? Why not? Hey, so I'm James Carey. Um, I run a management company. Um, I used to be a tour manager, which is what fits in well with today, about live performance royalties. Um, and now I've moved into kind of artist management and production. Yeah, yeah hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Bernard. I'm a CEO and co-founder of a music tech company called Sequence. And uh, we at Sequence believe that everyone producing music has a right to know where his or her music is being played. That's why we built the technology in order to recognize and track actually where your music is being played, whether on a live performance, in a radio show, or uh, on a live stream, and notify you in real time. And uh, that's what we do. Irena. Hi, everybody. My name is Irene Bauza. I'm the VP of Operations at Unison. We are an independent management entity, and it's a, a new uh, kind of uh, collecting society um, based in the tech. So we use technological uh, providers to help authors and publishers collect their rights. Got one. Hi, I'm Greg Marshall. I'm the general manager of AFEM, which is the Association for Electronic Music, and we're a global trade body for all businesses involved in electronic music, and we connect our members for business opportunities and to enable change in the industry where it's required. Thank you. So I'm going to give a very, very brief introduction to what we decided as a group would be the, the best core elements of publishing that we should explain to ensure that what ensues is not gonna be um, double dutch to everyone. Um, the first and most important message that we want to relay is that when we're talking about publishing, we're talking about the copyright in the composition, not the copyright in the recording. So we're talking about the people who write the, the compositions, the songs, all right? Um, and, and it can very often be different, a uh, different person to the artist. Um, there are two main royalty income sources, and that's all you need to remember. There's mechanicals, which could be the royalties generated by a download, um, or in the old days, like a CD sale or something. And then there's a performance royalty. So that's when your um, title is performed publicly. It could be on the TV or radio, or it could be, as is the topic of this particular panel, when your title, your song, is performed live, okay? Um, the other thing that's very important that you understand um, for this panel is that there is both a writer's share and a publisher's share of performance 
only in, in certain territories like the UK, US, Australia, but in continental Europe, there's a right to share also on the mechanical. The idea is that we need to make sure um, that you as writers or your people you represent as writers have access to the both sides, the publisher's share and the writer's share. Um, so there is the um, flow of accurate data is something else we wanted to explain and that is absolutely key to the successful journey from live performance to payment to the rights holder. And this, uh, this great flow is um, it begins at the source of the live performance. You see, I had to write this down because it is confusing. To ensure that the data about what has been performed reaches the collection society, but also the responsibility lies with the rights holder to ensure that he or she is affiliated to a performing rights organization <laughs> through which those royalties can be paid to them. So I hope that that very briefly sets the scene for what we're going to discuss today. And I now want to begin with you, James. Um, as an artist manager, can you explain some of the issues you have come across during your career which have hindered the accurate reporting of live performance data from your artists? So I think the first thing that I'm sure a lot of people in this room will probably agree with is that there's very little education about this topic. Um, a lot of people don't realize that there is money to be claimed from live performance royalties. And if they do, they often think that it's comparable to streaming royalty rates, which are often so minuscule that, you know, why bother? Um, the truth is that it's, it's, it's a completely different system. It, you earn a lot more money from it. It's definitely worth doing. Um, but I've, <laughs> I've had people who haven't filled out the set lists that they need to submit because they wanted to go and have dinner. You know, they wanted to go and have a beer. They weren't that interested. They didn't understand it. So even though that's kind of a frivolous reasoning as to why not to do it, that is probably the majority of cases. Um, there's also... I suppose a bit of a, uh, an issue with people who don't have management or an infrastructure that does this for them. If you're an independent artist, chances are that no one's told you that this is, this is how you go about doing this. Um, and as a result, yeah, you're just, you're just unaware. That's the main problem. You know, and if, you, if you're not aware of it, you can't do it. The process itself is actually very simple. You just fill out the set list. You can go to your PRO and you can just type it in where their live section is. But uh, for some reason, it's, it's often a bit difficult. <laughs> yeah, certainly. So, Greg, in your capacity as um, general manager for the Association for Electronic Music, you've been at the forefront of the um, AFM Get Played, Get Paid campaign. So what was it that was happening in the electronic music industry that, that made this a priority issue to, to bring to light? Um, I, guess, I guess if we take a, a quick step back in terms of the process of how these royalties actually occur. So clubs and festivals all over the world pay significant sums of money to performing and neighboring right organizations for every event that's, um, that they put on for the, for the music license. Um, who gets that money is dependent on accurate set list reporting. And, and what we were seeing was that for, for live shows and bands, it's generally in the band's interest to fill out a, a manual set list and they'll send it into their performing right organization and, and the money will come through to them because very often they've written the tracks that they're playing. With electronic music and, and DJing, very often the DJ may, may be a producer and maybe play a track or two within their set, which is their own, their own work. Um, there's very few... DJs that play all their own works when they're DJing out, or if they do, then they're either very prolific or very dull. Um, but, but essentially, it's not necessarily in the, the interest of the DJ to fill out a set list. And so, um, and very often also, the, the processes for performing right organizations didn't involve um, uh, requesting set lists from, from DJs. So often they would just pay the money that they're receiving from clubs. Um, for example, they pool it and pay it out over radio play instead of accurate data as to what's being played in the club. So AFM wanted to shine a light on this, um, raise awareness of the issue, and advocate for the use of music recognition technology um, by performing rights organizations at both, in both clubs and, and at festivals. 
Okay, well, we're going to talk a little bit more later about music recognition technology. But now I wanted to ask you, Irina, um, it seems that even when there is accurate data in place, it just takes an incredibly long time from the date of the live performance to the date that the royalties will be actually paid to the rights holder, even if um, everything is properly recorded. Can you explain some of the reasons why it's such a long process compared with royalties on, say, the recording side for streaming, which seem to come through much quicker? Well, um, I, I can honestly say I do not know. <laughs> um, it should be as easy as to, okay, what's being played? We're just going to invoice whoever the promoter is. And then in a matter of, let's say, a month, uh, the, the rights holders get paid. But all this process, because of, of also what Greg said, that uh, it's not really what's being played is going to get paid. It's just they have uh, the normal collecting societies, traditional collecting societies, have other processes to, to, um, to collect and distribute music. So what we're doing from Unison is to actually get as much data as possible and um, pay out as quick as possible, because that's what the uh, collecting society uh, should do, is uh, we don't want to keep the money for a long time. It's just the process is long. So what we're doing is using technological uh, works, technological providers to get the data as, as soon as possible, invoice the person, the, the promoter, and uh, pay the writers uh, as quick as possible. You make it sound quite easy, and it makes me wonder why, why um, the more traditional collection societies haven't adopted it sooner. What, what gives Unison the edge to be able to um, try and make a change in this regard? Technological, uh, the, te the technology is there. Mm. It's just that uh, traditional collecting societies come from other times when there was no uh, technological uh, solutions. They had to literally, uh, the writers or the publishers had to write down the, the, the set list, had to uh, send it to the, to the PRO. All of this was done with paper. Like. Yeah. I suppose it's because you're brand new, uh, or pretty new, uh, mm -hmm. that you have the luxury of being able to look at it with a fresh eye and not try to adapt older processes into a changing uh, you know, situation on the live side. I'm going to move back to James a minute. I was a bit concerned when you said that you, you know, many of your um, artists are more concerned about their dinner <laughs> um, than filling out their set lists. Um, if, if I stood here with a five pound note and I said, James, come and get my five quid, you wouldn't say I want to have dinner first. You'd probably take the money and then use it for your dinner, right? Absolutely. So, so <laughs> what, have you any ideas about how you can better motivate your artists to take this, um, this whole issue seriously? I think the first thing is awareness. So everyone who has come to this event obviously wants to educate themselves, and that's a good sign. Um, often m music education programs tend not to deal with this kind of thing. I mean, if you go to a university and you study music business, you do something like that, of course it's going to be covered. But most of the time when you're at school, making money from music is not the topic. It's kind of, it's, it's a classical music education or it's music production, etc. cetera. Um, so first of all, if they knew that there was essentially a five pound for their dinner waiting for them, I'm sure they would go for it. Um, but because, because of that ignorance, um, which, and there is sort of a little bit of a class thing here as well. Like some people don't have access to those kind of, that kind of education. Some people aren't in, in the position to know that and putting the pressure on the artist to be the one who claims the money is actually somewhat unfair, and a, a top-down kind of system would be a lot better. Like, if, if the onus was on the venues, as it is in some territories, uh, to actually provide the set lists rather than the artists, and that was a legal requirement, I think that would be a much more suitable way of dealing with this. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of, yeah, in terms of the motivation, it's just knowing that there's money to be claimed from this. I mean, that's the thing that everyone struggles with as a musician, you know, like actually making a living from it. This is a key revenue stream, and that in itself should be motivation enough. Um, it's just making sure that's out there and that people actually know that. Yeah, thank you. So, Bernard, over to you. You cough, you knew your time was coming. So, Sequence aims to simplify and modernize the way in which artists can record and declare their set list, something that James was uh, adhering to. And um, be it from DJ sets or more traditional live performances, from bands, for example. Can you explain what Sequence is doing, uh, especially to motivate uh, people to, to take this seriously? Absolutely. So um, 
One essential source for uh, creating set lists is uh, our own smartphone app. So basically we provide a smartphone app that is uh, using uh, audio fingerprint technology in order to uh, listen to what uh, the performing artists, the DJ, the bands are performing at the spot, generating the set list, which can then be ultimately reported actually. So um, at the same time, I have to say, we, we are agnostic to the source where the, the music is actually being played. It doesn't have to be our own app. Uh, can be any live stream on the internet that we feed in into our uh, real-time um, uh, platform. Uh, and doing exactly the same, the same magic, identifying the tracks, finding out whose music is in there, creating the set list, which can ultimately then uh, being reported, used by publishers or even uh, um, PROs, uh, in order to to ensure uh, that the people get get paid, whose music is paid. And, and paid. how is that possibly motivating? I mean, it, does it not go beyond? Does just which sequence do you go beyond? Um, what we've been, been talking about so far in terms of you know getting your live performance royalties from say a, a collection society you, you mentioned there's another exactly so actually we 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 started initially to build something that uh, notifies anyone producing music whenever his or her music is being used somewhere around the world so we didn't think so much about royalties back then but ultimately with, uh, uh, with with growth and more and more people uh, using it we see that it can be a credible source for uh, for the royalty uh, story uh, uh, as such. So that's, yeah. uh, that's good to see that we actually come from a more uh, experimental and more uh, out of curiosity uh, uh, of uh, and, and the, the, the curiosity of, of producers actually to, to get to know where, where the music is being used. And now we see that uh, actually the, it's beneficial to the whole industry to, to build on, on such data because mm. Ultimately, there will be multiple fun. sources. <laughs> it sounds more fun than if you just speak about royalties to, to these people that who are producing exactly. and playing music. So, Greg, um, the Get Played, Get Paid campaign is releasing some very positive results now. Um, you mentioned MRT, music recognition technology, before. Um, could you explain um, a bit more to everyone who, who may not know like what exactly that is and how some societies are now using it to access live performance data for both licensing and royalty distribution purposes? Okay, you quite a lot in there. What um, is MRT? So, <laughs> so music recognition technology is essentially, well, things like sequence. There's a, there's some other other uh, major player uh, companies that are linked in with performing and neighbouring right organisations uh, currently. But it is essentially a service that takes a, a low resolution recording of a show, uh, references it with their uh, the recordings they have in their reference library and again provides a, a report of a set list to to whoever the, the customer might be that says this is what was played at this, uh, this event. Um, the the way we're talking about it at the moment or certainly the interest from, from AFEM's perspective is for DJ set list accuracy um, and the way that's the way the MRT services in that space are working currently is there are service providers that uh, go to clubs and festivals and plug in uh, essentially a, a, an MRT box um, and that provides, they do recordings, they, re they reference them to their libraries uh, and then uh, on the basis of the reporting that comes uh, back from, from what they identify, they, the performing and neighbouring right organisations pay out royalties accordingly. But it's, th it's only the performing and neighbouring right organisations that are engaging with these companies that are uh, you know, are being progressive. There's so we, we when we started the Get Played, Get Paid campaign, it was around four years ago, uh, there were three territories in which um, performing right organizations were using music recognition technology. So it was Boomer in Holland. They were using DJ Monitor for festival um, monitoring. Um, APRA in Australia were using DJ Monitor and Pioneers Cuvo for uh, club and festival monitoring, and SASM in France for using a company called um, Yarcast um, for club monitoring. And since then, you know, since we've sort of we've raised awareness of this issue in the media, um, we kind of highlighted that at the time we estimated around 100 million euros a year uh, of, of, of DJ performance royalties or or um, creators' royalties. Uh, were being misappropriated 
or misdirected, um, and that sort of caused a, a bit of a, a bit of a, a wave, I guess, in the media. And since then, we've now seen uh, rights organisations in 15 territories adopting uh, tech solutions to set list reporting for DJ events to differing levels. But uh, but it's been you know there's been significant progress, but there's a lot more to do. Well, that's really good. Thank you. So, but how are, how are the collection societies who are adopting whatever form of MRT suits them best at this time? How are they um, working out where they should place the boxes or the um, MRT technology? Uh, it's it differs in different territories. So, I mentioned in in Holland, they're predominantly using the technology to uh, to monitor festivals. Um, festivals over a certain value they automatically put DJ Monitor um, into those festivals and they pay out the licensing fee based on exactly what um, DJ Monitor identify as being Boomer Repertoire. Um, in, say, for example, uh, in Germany, I'm aware that they, they do statistical analysis of the, the types of venues across the country and the types of music that's being played in those venues and the, the venue sizes, and they come up with a map as to where they think if they put a, a Yarkas box, they will get a, a, uh, a representative spread of what's being played in clubs around Germany. So um, it's a very different process in Germany. I think Yarkas doesn't record everything that's being played in a club from start to finish. They, do a, they take a sample of a few hours a week in each club, but they do have a pretty broad spread of... Uh, I think they have around 120 clubs on their on their panel um, where they're getting data from. So it's it's very different um, in different territories. But uh, essentially, they're either using technology to get a, a sample of what's being played in clubs to then uh, to then sort of extrapolate uh, the, the royalty payments across that sample of data, or they're using it at high high value events where they're paying a specific license fee from that event. To, yeah. to across the data that's being um, captured from that yeah, event. Because from what I've heard, the um, the technology is relatively expensive, a little bit uh, needs some uh, tech to, to uh, take care of it in the venues as well. Um, maybe any of you know I what's happening with the further development of the existing MRT technology. On the one hand, you have something that seems a lot more mobile, like Sequences um, app, but um, you know DJ Monitor and, and BMAT have their own technology that is being used by by various societies. But they're having to choose, um, you know, they have to choose a sample. Um, do, do, are they continuing to evolve and um, work on their technology? Do, do you happen to know to make it cheaper and less cumbersome? Well, I, I think I mean it's a commercial market. So uh, as I mentioned at the at the moment, there are kind of, in terms of uh, clients, uh, music recognition tech companies with performing right organization clients, there are three main companies doing it for events, and that's Yarkas, DJ Monitor, and BMAT. Um, for them to remain um, commercially competitive, I think they're always trying to drive down the price of what they do. Uh, I think the... Like the Part of the issue is often that clubs aren't necessarily that interested in having these boxes deployed. There can be some resistance. Bernard, as a startup, um, how are you managing to compete with some of the more established MRT companies? Do you find that the collection societies are receptive to your um, your version of technology and, and how it can be used? Um, I mean, what is what is what we have to point out, and what I think uh, linked to what what Greg just said is that we really see a momentum in adoption of uh, of MRT technology um, globally. So that's a that's a good sign, uh, and thanks to uh, associations and, and uh, strong strong communities like Association for Electronic Music, um, we raise awareness that uh, this brings value to everyone, and this is uh, beneficial for. Uh, for the whole industry, so that's what uh, uh, allows us to to start collaborations with uh, rights organizations as well as publishers, because it's uh, at the same time very very uh, essential information for the publishers as well. So uh, that, that's a good sign. Uh, what we have to point out is that it's about it's it's up to everyone uh, in the industry. It's up to a, a every artist, every producer, every label out there uh, to talk about music recognition technology and to make it a topic and be aware that this uh, 
it's a credible source and technology in order to generate data. Because what we believe is that uh, there will always be multiple sources for, for music data, and it's especially of uh, performance music data. Uh, and we will we'll have to harmonize and aggregate it in a proper way and make it, make it usable. And that's where tech companies like, like we do uh, can, can, can help to, to, uh, to progress. Yeah, no, well, that, that exactly mirrors the next question I had for you, Irina. Like, how do you see that a, a progressive collection society such as Unison Rights, I, is there a place for, for you uh, in, you know, in parallel to the more traditional collection societies? How can you happily coexist but make sure that the rights holders get uh, more efficiently what, what's theirs? So what, what, what we're doing is, uh, as of now, because we know there's still traditional uh, uh, traditional societies, traditional artists that write down their, their set list. Uh, what we're doing now is using both technology and the uh, set list that, that a writer would write. And what we're doing is we're comparing with, uh, with our providers and seeing, okay, is this, is this uh, um, it, does it match? If it match, if it matches up to 99%, what we're gonna do in the future is, okay, let's leave all the manual work uh, uh, behind that the, on the, either the, art, the artist or the author, the publisher is gonna have to do, and let's leave uh, uh, tech uh, to do all the work uh, that uh, an author or a publisher would have to do. So. Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think there's uh, a, a way. Um, there's a way for uh, more traditional collecting societies, and whoever wants to to keep on being there is good. Uh, but I think we have to move forward and and let um, technological solutions help authors and publishers get what what they're owed. Yeah, maybe it will be possible. I mean, I know um, that it's possible for publishers to withdraw their um, digital uh, rights from co various collection societies in order to um, more, uh, more efficiently collect the uh, royalties due from the digital service providers, for example. That was something that was quite revolutionary at the time, but it was a necessity in order to accurately collect from the volume of DSPs. So perhaps that's something that can happen on the live side, um, that yes. people can choose to use a more efficient situation. Yes, so, so what the directive says is they can actually withdraw any kind of rights, uh, 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 so they can withdraw the live, the live performances. They can withdraw radio, TV, and and they can even spread it through societies now. So, let's say that the traditional society in your local space is really good at at, at um, uh, collecting and distributing um, live performance royalties. You can stay with with your traditional society for that side of the of your work. And uh, Unison or what, whatever other uh, independent management entity or whatever other collecting society is really good at digital or at radio and TV, they can spread through different societies. D and sorry, one last question for you. Do you think that it was possible to set up Unison Rights in Spain because of the difficult situation in Spain with um, the PRO then not um, operating at maximum efficiency, so there was a window? And do you think that that will be an obstacle to similar new societies such as yours opening up in other territories around the world? I mean, what the, what the law says is that now those, the independent management entities can be anywhere, so anywhere, any place any year, in Europe, uh, not, not, not in other countries as of yet, uh, and other countries like Brazil has seven collecting societies. Uh, but um, what it says is that it can, they can appear in any place. Uh, the fact that Unison started in Spain, um, where we have a, a, a collecting society not so efficient or trans transparent, uh, yes, there was an opportunity, but we, we, we go farther than that. There, we didn't choose Spain because there was a, a, a non-efficient collecting society. We chose Spain because that's where the, the opportunity came and that's where uh, our CEO and everybody was at. But yeah. it, they came before the actual 
problem. It, it's uh, quite interesting as well from what Greg's told me that Spain is one of the territories that the, the Spanish society is, is one of the ones that has um, adopted music recognition technology more than any other territory. So um, there's no straight story. Um, so just another question I have. Um, James, I'm going to throw it at you. Um, do you see a future where there will be one port of call and one format for global live performance royalty reporting? Wouldn't that be a utopia? That would be a utopia. Yeah. My, my only sort of gripe with that is um, kind of similar to what Greg was saying about the music recognition technology. Um, you need competition to make people perform better. You know, like the, uh, the reason that Unison has decided to adopt the technology they have is because no one else is doing that. But as soon as that becomes a big thing, other people will start and you've always got to stay one step ahead of the competition. So in order to kind of regulate it and make sure it's fair, I think it's kind of essential that there are multiple ways to do it. But there should be one kind of methodology, if that makes sense. Like it shouldn't be so different between territories that you can't just look up generally, you know, how do I do this? And it's completely wrong for one territory. You know, there does need to be some kind of, um, some kind of utopia, but one where people are competing because also it keeps people on the straight and narrow. You know, if there's just one company that's administrating everything, then what they say goes and the transparency disappears. So I have more general questions, but I just first wanted to gauge how many questions any of you may have, because I would rather give you the floor and ask us anything you want. So there is someone there. Um, I don't know if someone comes with a mic or, um, or whether we should, or you want to come up here and, and answer it. But I, I don't know. Yes, or shout. But uh, yeah, come up. It's good I'm, if you're not embarrassed. Yeah, hi. Um, so my name is Peter Krell. I'm from Wave Academy. Um, we are a school here in Berlin. And I'm also parallelly um, the ambassador of uh, Hashgraph, which is a new technology you may be familiar with um, within this realm. Or can I ask one uh, question? Who of you knows about Hashgraph? So Hashgraph um, is a distributed ledger technology um, which is focused on um, security, on uh, speed, on um, um, performance, and also um, on fairness. So um, this technology is uh, fairly capable of um, reaching consensus among uh, people who don't trust each other, but who need to reach consensus in order to do operational business. And from my point of view, um, the proposed business cases here are completely in line with this uh, technology. So we, I'm very happy to speak to you further about this after uh, the talks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, is, is, is this the way it works that everyone comes up here or should, should you give the mic to someone, this, someone there? Thanks. He should have been on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Well, it's all about the comp competition, right? as you said. <laughs> oh, should I ask my question or should I give my remark from here? Is that yes, okay? If you're, yeah, now you have a mic, you can do whatever you feel comfortable <laughs> okay. with, thank you. Don't worry. No, I'm Jens, I'm a publisher working for Meisel Music Verlag, which is uh, one of the traditional publishers here, here in Berlin. And um, first of all, I'm a little bit disappointed to see that there's no real publisher on the panel. I would have liked to have more real publishers. Can I just interrupt and ask you, what's a real publisher? I mean, I, I have over two decades of publishing experience, okay, albeit sorry. as an administrator. Oh, oh, okay. um, so you can no, probably ask and fire but away. A, man a manager is not a publisher, for example. The, re the, the reason I'm, I'm mentioning that is because the whole discussion uh, goes about uh, technology and uh, you know gadgets which help to uh, monitor and so on, which I totally agree to, and that's a nice thing. But there's one thing, for example, for the performance, um, for the uh, collecting of performance income, it's not really the problem of not having uh, the right way of monitoring missing income. The biggest problem is that. Uh, live venues do not pay their bills. That's a problem. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm uh, working with GEMA in Germany, and the reason why um, there's a lot of money coming uh, will be distributed later is not that they don't have the data. It's more like 
the venues, the clubs, they don't pay their bills. And if they don't pay the bill, you cannot pay out the money. I think that, the, um, thank you, and that's a very good additional point that, you know, the lack of data is only one of the reasons why the royalties won't always reach the rights holder correctly. Um, I've worked internationally in publishing for so long, and I know that for the clients I had, I often had to try to get them their live performance royalties from various territories, and the collection society in those territories would say, um, that there's an issue with the venue not paying their license. So um, one of the things that um, is, is going on in parallel to the MRT discussion is also how can you motivate the venues to pay um, appropriately or uh, as they should. So the whole uh, infrastructure of live performance uh, royalty collection is being looked at and, and hopefully people will be incentivized. Um, thank you. <laughs> Just you can always speak to me after as well, of course. Just to, just to add into that, so if the issue with venues often not paying their bills uh, or being resistant to paying their bills, certainly on, you know, my interest is in the electronic music side of things, so with DJ performances. Um, and historically, uh, the likes of, of Gamer and other performing right organizations would approach a venue uh, to license them for the music they played, uh, give them a bill, but then not require reporting as to what's being played and so very often there's mistrust between venues and the licensing organization because they didn't feel that the money they were paying was going to the correct tracks and so what we're talking about here is the implementation of technology so that when um, a venue is paying a license that they know that the correct artists and rights holders are paid uh, with the money that they're paying. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Does anyone else have a question or a comment or a criticism? Anything goes here. Uh, sorry, it's, uh, it's just a question on the on the um, device or, or the technique. Um, is it possible to also recognize improvised music, which was not recorded before in that way? So the timbre of the the players. Or yeah, uh, great question. So we. We initially started when uh, referring to uh, music recognition technology, and it actually applies to to, to most of the uh, of the vendors out there. Is um, uh, can be tricky if it's instrumental and it is live performed. But we are looking into uh, uh, research that allows us to get closer to that. Still, that's a, that's really a gap. So we see audio fingerprinting technology that is trying to solve that. We haven't adopted it yet, but we will look into um, because ultimately the, the the vision is to identify whichever track, whichever version it is, may it be uh, hand performed uh, by a band, whatever. It, we we should we should be able with technology to recognize that. Are we there yet? Probably not. I, w I would also like to add, of course, um, that you know if you are. Uh, making different versions of songs and there's an um, additional ISRC, you know, uh, identifying that recording, then, you know, it's very important to ensure that the publisher, publishing administrator can make the uh, connection between that particular work with that particular unique uh, identification number and, and your work with the registration at the Collection Society. So some administrators like Songtrust, we, we directly link the titles to the recordings and that also helps. So it's definitely a cooperation between the publishers, the societies and the people who are supplying the technology. But when it comes to cover songs or uh, covering uh, original tracks then it, or and songs, then it really becomes interesting because uh, imagine how many songs are performed and, and covered today out there on a live performance. Uh, which probably are not uh, recognized because uh, they don't sound exactly like like the original one, and that's that's an open gap. Uh, technology once will close it, and we're working on that, but it's it's we are not yet there. That's that's true. Good, very good point. Yes. But specifically on your point about improvisation, um, an improvised performance is never going to be recognized by a music recognition technology company because. It requires a recording in the back end to reference again. So if something is improvised, um, there's no reference material in the reference library to link it to, and it's a it's a good point. So even the, the most the most efficient music recognition technology company needs to have the recordings in their reference library to be able to identify what's being played by the DJ. And so in terms of an action from any any um, artists or labels or publishers in the room. 
ensure that your tracks are, are, are delivered to the music recognition technology companies that are being used by the performing rights organizations around the world to ensure that when your tracks are played in clubs or in festivals, and sometimes they use these for broadcast as well, that, uh, that the tracks are identified and you receive the royalties due. So there's, um, it, it kind of it requires the whole industry to engage in this for it to work. Artists need to supply um, recordings. The artists need to be members of performing rights organizations and register their tracks. Publishers need to ensure they register the tracks. Um, and the, the music recognition tech companies need to have the recordings in the back end. So it's more than um, the responsibility lies with sort of the entire industry to make it work. Thank you. Does anyone? Oh, one more question. Um, first, I'll go to the person at the back who's not spoken yet. Um, and if someone wants to tell us about the time situation. Okay, we have a minute left, so that's a few questions with quick answers, uh, I think. Hi. Hi. I'm Magnus from the uh, Lucid Music and the Little Label. I also produce music. I have like 50 releases out on 70 labels. And uh, otherwise, uh, one question. If I release a track, I give it to the label, the label gives it to the distributor, and you have to pay a fee for Spotify, for Shazam, and all the stuff. And you get a little bit of it. Uh, where get you your money from? I mean, you grab in the cake of the whole one euro fifty, two euros, or from releasing a track? I think it's more. Uh, I, I mean, perhaps I'm. It, well, I, th I think it's more like how can he? How can you get? How are you going to be remunerated for the use of your work? Uh, right? Is that what you're asking? Uh, my question is, you don't do it for free, <laughs> like <laughs> everyone else. So. Oh, I think it's the collection societies, right? And and the people who are who choose to adopt it because the more traditional uh, collection societies, at least, at least their their job is to distribute as much as much in royalties as possible, and to have as little in, um, as possible left over that in what's called unallocated uh, income, which can end up in something called the black box, which traditionally was always given to the larger, major publishers, uh, and very few of any of those would distribute it to the rights holders. And if they did, it would be based on market share of however much was distributed. So it, it's always very complicated. And um, uh, but but all we can say is that that you know, albeit that there's not that much money that can go to everyone, it's in, it's imperative that any writer registers their songs. And even if they're only going to get 0 0.0001 pennies for it, just keep doing it because the getting the data out there um, is integral. I think. So I think I'm being told that it's time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much for this fantastic panel. Let's give a really warm round of applause. Yeah, thank you. If anyone wants to speak to us afterwards, please do. And um, anything's fine. Exactly. Thank you. If you want to have any more questions with the speakers, with the panelists, just meet them in the speakers lounge. We have to set up the stage for the next panel and have a quick break. Thank you. <laughs>